Hi, this is Simon Obstall, and welcome to another tutorial for Apple Motion. And today we're going to be taking a look at a technique that I've often used in my tutorials. And for want of a better name, I call it blur scaling, because it's a two-step process that involves adding a blur and then scaling the result. And it's something that has a lot of different and interesting uses. In fact, the ident for this tutorial was made using this technique. So I thought it'd be useful to take a detailed look at exactly how and why it works. So let's get into it. So to start off with, I want us to consider what actually is happening when we create a blur. Now, the simplest kind of blur is called a box blur. And that's where every pixel is averaged against the pixels that are nearest to it. And the blur radius determines how many of those nearest pixels are used for the average. So in this schematic, we're looking at a five by five box blur. So it's a matrix of five by five pixels. And that's the, basically the size, the radius of the actual blur. And obviously each pixel has a set of neighboring pixels. So the immediate neighbors are these three rows and columns. And out from that, we have these five rows and columns. And those all get averaged together. So what I've actually done to show you this is I've created a homemade box blur using motion. And here's my original image. And I've used this kind of crosshatch to try and accentuate it because a five by five box blur is not a great deal. So here, if I turn that off, is my homemade blur. And let's look at how it's done. So you'll see that inside this group, there's my original image and there are 24 clones of it. So 25 images in all. And if we remind ourselves of our matrix, we've got five by five. So that's obviously 25 pixels that we need to compare. And so that's how we get to this. And so each of these layers is offset according to that matrix. So at the bottom here, I've got a pixel that's offset by one pixel on X and down one pixel on Y. And the next one is just down one pixel on Y. And the next one is one pixel to the left on X and one pixel down on Y and so on. And as we get up the matrix, we, we're using two pixels out. So obviously, these outer columns and rows are kind of two pixels away from the center. So if we looked at this pixel, for example, that would be negative two on X and plus one on Y, for example. And this one here would be negative two on X and plus two on Y and so on. So then what I've done is I've added them all together using the additive blend mode, as you can see here. So that figure of 4%, it's kind of pretty obvious where that is, 100% divided by 25 gives us four. So there you have it. That's how to build a basic box blur. So that's the original, that's the blurred version. But let's actually look at a conventional blur in action. So I'm in a new project here. And I'm just going to bring in a color solid and I'm going to make it black. And then I'm going to use the rectangle tool to make a rectangle. So holding down the shift key, I'm going to make a rectangle like that. Well, obviously I'm in a square. I'm going to make sure to uh, center it up. And for the purposes of this demonstration, I want the size to be 20 pixels. And let's zoom right into this so we can see. So you probably immediately notice that around this square, there are sort of a couple of lines of, of, of gray that's not black or not white. And this is in fact the anti-aliasing of this rectangle. So what is anti-aliasing? So we can actually turn it off if we switch to draft mode and you can see that we've got none of those gray pixels. And if we then actually try to, for example, rotate this box, you'll see it looks really horrible. Whereas if we come back to normal, you'll see that we've got these gray pixels and that if we zoom out a little bit, it just removes the, that jagginess that we get with this basic un anti aliased version. So anti-aliasing is basically a form of blur, as you can probably guess, because we've got gray values on the edges there. So I'm going to reset that rotation and let's add to this group a basic Gaussian blur. Now Gaussian blur is a bit more sophisticated than 
the box blur that we looked at, but from the point of this demonstration, it doesn't actually make any difference. So what I'm actually going to do is set this amount to 10. And I want you to look what we've now got. We've got a lot more sort of shades of grey. You know, if we discounted that anti-aliasing, we've got shades of grey between the black of the background and the white of the foreground square. And that confirms that basically what we're doing is averaging the values of the neighbouring pixels. So you'll notice that currently the centre is white, but if I increase the Gaussian blur amount to 20, remember that radius is actually relates to pixels, and that centre pixel is now, if you can probably see, if you look at these numbers while I hover, the centre pixel is now just slightly off-white, and as we increase, that becomes ever more grey. And that's because even the centre pixel is being averaged with the black pixels out here. So what I'm going to do now is increase that blur amount to 128, and I'm going to zoom out. And you can see that's gone really, really grey. So first of all, I'm going to do what I normally do, and that's to add a filters, colour and levels. And then I'm going to crush those whites as much as I possibly can. And you can see that all those central grey pixels have now become white. Uh, we've still got a little fringe of grey. And interestingly enough, our rectangle has now turned into a circle. So there's our original rectangle. There's our blurred and crushed result. And it's turned into a circle. So that's starting to seem really interesting, isn't it? So I'm actually not going to use levels for most of this. I'm going to come back to levels later on and explain exactly why it's useful. But I'm actually going to use instead filters, colour and threshold. And I'm going to reduce that threshold down to 0 0.01. And I'm going to reduce the smoothness down to zero. And now something really quite interesting has happened. We've actually got a white circle with no fringing, with no grey fringing at all. And that's what threshold is doing. Basically, anything above the threshold is white and anything below the threshold is black. And that's why we're getting this result here. You'll notice that smoothness starts to bring in some latitude to that calculation. But I'm going to leave that switched to zero for the time being. So with these settings, I'm going to increase the size of my rectangle. So I'm going to go up to 250. And you'll notice that we've got with these, with this blur, we've actually got a nice rounded cornered rectangle. So then I'm going to duplicate that rectangle, right click duplicate, and then I'm going to move it away from the original. And I want you to look what happens. We get this really interesting kind of sucking effect. And then at some point they separate, but you can see they're kind of glued together. And this is a really nice result that we get from using this method, because obviously we're applying it to the, the, the group overall. And the more we increase this blur value, so if we went for like 256, the more that is going to be exaggerated. So grab that rectangle again and move it and you can see it looks really nice and sticky. And indeed I used this in a tutorial on creating cell division and I'm going to put a link to that in the description because it's quite a nice use of this technique. So then let's look what happens if we adjust that threshold and you can see that the blobs sort of separate and they just keep shrinking and they actually shrink down to nothing. So that's a really interesting option as well. We can actually just make things sort of gradually shrink in a very nice kind of organic way using this technique. And what happens if we adjust the blur? So if we adjust the blur, we just get more and more roundness. And that's kind of more or less what I ended up with my cell division. You see, we've got this really nice sort of hourglass effect. So both the blur amount and the threshold are going to determine how this actually looks. So basically this technique is what I call kind of blobifying. You know, we've got kind of gloopy blobs. And I want to actually show you what it looks like if we add in some text. So I'm going to add in the word blur. I've obviously got my threshold is so high that we're not actually seeing that. I'm going to increase that size to 250 and you can see that we've got something there. And it's just, it's, it's just another blob, in fact. But if I turn off my threshold and Gaussian blur, you can see that's our nice clean text. Again, we can adjust that threshold and that kind of sticks together like that. 
if we reduce that blur amount progressively, that's a really useful kind of reveal one can do there, where if you just adjust that blur value, we're kind of revealing the text out of these blobs. And I, I really like that effect. So I'm just going to turn off these rectangles and center up that text and just make it much, much larger so I can show you the next bit. Let's zoom right in so we can see the edges. So if I turn up the blur amount, you can see what this is also doing, just as our rectangle turned into a circle. When we apply it to text, we get this nice kind of rounding effect. Again, you might, in this instance, probably just kind of back off on the uh, on the threshold like that to kind of get a, a smoother result. But you can see that, again, that's a really useful thing to be able to do, just to kind of round the corners of text or any other object you want to round the corners of. And I also want to show you, while we're looking at this, how the threshold value allows us to grow or shrink the size of the object. So if I increase that threshold value, you'll notice that my text progressively shrinks. Sort of almost starts to disappear there, but it's actually much more smaller there. Conversely, if I reduce the threshold, my text expands. So at a threshold value of 0.5, essentially not a great deal is happening to the text in terms of its overall size. Obviously we're getting that rounding, but we're not getting any kind of shrinking or expanding. But below 0.5, we're getting expansion, and above 0.5, we're getting shrinking. And the reason for that is that if we make more of the gray values white, we'll get expansion. And if we make more of the gray values black, we'll get shrinkage. And this technique is actually really useful in kind of advanced compositing because it allows you to shrink or expand a mat very, very carefully and, and smoothly. And, and it's kind of very widely used in visual effects. So that's a, it's, it's a really useful technique from that point of view as well. So as you can see, there are lots of applications to this technique. So finally, I want to point out something about levels. I said I would, I would come back to it. Now, obviously, threshold is working pretty well and, and we've got a softness control and everything. So it's, you know, in most respects, it's actually working really nicely. But I'm actually going to turn off turn back on some of these rectangles so I can actually just turn this rectangle on and I'm just going to increase its size so I can show you what I mean here. So the problem we have is that threshold won't work on the alpha channel, it'll only work on RGB. So to explain what I mean, I'm going to grab those and I'm going to move them onto the text instead of the group. And you can now see that we've got this rather annoying well, I mean, it might not be annoying, it might, might be something you want, but we've got this kind of, of shadowing effect. And that's because the threshold is not actually affecting the alpha channel. It's only affecting the RGB. So as we shrink more and more, we get more and more of that black. And that's obviously not something that we would normally want unless we actually think we like that effect. So that's why instead of threshold, when it's a case of there being an alpha channel that we need to shrink, I use levels. And that's because levels allows us to access alpha and it's here. So instead of RGB, let's access alpha and then we can use the alpha controls to sharpen up the text. And you can see we don't get that, that fringing because we're just literally manipulating the alpha there. If you want to be very precise about this, you can open up the histogram and you can come down and, ah, where's alpha? It's called opacity. Don't, don't ask me why uh, Apple decided to call it alpha here and opacity down there. It's pretty daft, I have to say. But if we get this black in value really close to that white in value, we can get a really sharp result. I'm just going to turn off that rectangle so we don't need to see it. So the, the closer we get those two values together, actually, I'm going to increase that Gaussian blur value. Let's go back up to 128 so we can, we can see this properly. So if I go for, for example, 0.4 on the black in, and 0.401 on the white in, we get a really sharp result like that. In fact, for most purposes, that's much too sharp because we're seeing those jaggies. And obviously the wider apart those values are, the softer that's going to be. So 0.45 is actually quite a nice smooth result. So there you go, that's an overview of blur scaling. And although it's quite a simple technique, as you can see, it has lots of interesting uses.
So I hope you found that useful. Thanks very much indeed for watching. See you again soon.